And now I'd like to call to order the October 2nd, 2019 formal city council meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio? Here. Councilmember Garcia? Here. Councilwoman Guardado? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Waring? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. We have an interpreter here today with us. Mario, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor. My name is Mario Guarajas. I'm gonna be making a brief announcement in Spanish to our Spanish speakers. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Voy a estar sirviendo como el intérprete de español esta tarde. Si acaso alguien necesitara el servicio de intérprete, pueden acudir al personal de la ciudad hacia la parte de atrás para poder obtener los aparatos para recibir la interpretación en español. Gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Would the clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6617 and 6625 through 6629, S46047 through 46082, and resolutions 21769 and 21783 through 21786. Thank you. We have a group of distinguished uh, community members who are willing to serve our city as board and commission members. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion? Move to approve mayor and council uh, boards and commission nominations. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Me? Nay. Passes unanimously. Congratulations to our new board and commission members. We will now swear them in. I state your name, do solemnly swear, <coughs> that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially Discharge the duties of the office of to the best of my ability. So help me God. Congratulations and thank you for your service. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion? I do. Mayor, I make a motion to suspend the rules and take item 60 out of order. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Councilwoman Williams, do you have a motion? I do. I have a few words to uh, say about a special guest we have today, but I move approval of this item, first of all. Second. Do you want the vote? Now? have a motion and a second. I think we'll take... Uh, yeah, we'll, just do, we'll take the vote and then we will have comments. Okay. Um, roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. 
Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Passes unanimously. Great. I am uh, going to turn the meeting over to Councilman Williams and say hello to our special guest today. A very special, handsome guest over there. His name is Rowan. Rowan was born in the Netherlands on November 2, 2008. He was brought to the United States by Lon Vic Kennels, when, where Rowan was trained by experts to be a dual-purpose canine, meaning he can do detection work, search for narcotics, and protection work, search for the bad guys. At 20 months old, Rowan became one of the Phoenix's finest when he joined the Phoenix Police Department canine unit, and he was assigned to his partner, canine officer Stephen Mead. For 10 years, Rowan and Officer Mead worked the Grace Guards shift, keeping the city safe while we all slept. At home, he was beloved, even though he was one of our toughest officers when he was on duty. After 10 years of faithful service, Rowan has earned his retirement and the opportunity to spend the rest of his life in peace with the family he loves. Officer Mead and Rowan would thank the city, the Phoenix Police Department, and the community for the opportunity to live a virtuous life of service in the highest regard. We would also like to present Canine Rowan with his retirement cake, or some <laughs> refer to <laughs> uh, which was donated by one of our great local businesses, the Barkery, and wish Rowan and the entire Mead family many happy trails or tales in the future. You have a paper? Or outside? Yeah, yeah. Mike, yeah. Mike's freaking out. Mike's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, say some for later. <laughs> but but if you couldn't hear, Officer Mead did share canine Ronan liked the pup cake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he likes the frosting best. Thank you to Councilwoman Williams for that beautiful tribute. And we are looking forward to today's council meeting, but I think that might have been the highlight uh, right there. So. We are glad to celebrate all who serve our city, and congratulations. We will now move to the liquor license portion of our agenda. We advise the state of Arizona on liquor license applications. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion? Uh, move to approve uh, items 2 through 29, uh, with item 3 is being continued until October 16, 2019. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, Mayor. Move to approve items 30 through 98, except the following. Items 34, 31, excuse me, 31, 34, 36, 37, 38, 43, 
59, and 95, 96, and 97. Items 42 and 88 are requested to be continued to November 6th, 2019. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any council member comments? Roll call. Desicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. No, we're good. Thank you for asking. Item 31, Leonard Clark has a card marked in favor. Mr. Clark, if you could please come forward and testify. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, temporarily, I'm not technically a citizen anymore of Phoenix, but don't worry, I'll find a way back here. Um, it's been a while. No, um, I think this is good. I know that some of our uh, fiscally conservative council members might have some issues about, I think this is the one on the mayors or the other one funding for the council, the other thing. But uh, I think it's good that we get along with the rest of the like mayors. And I think uh, the other thing that you're doing there, I can't remember exactly what it was a national thing that you guys do. Uh, I think that it's very good that you would back the funding for it. Again, I can understand your issues, your fiscal issues you're concerned on, but we need to be a part of the 50 states. What are we now? I can't remember. I'm sorry. See, this is what happens when I get rusty. We're either fifth or sixth largest city in the United States of America now, so we do have to play w with all the other kids. So anyways, thank you. I hope you'll vote for this. Thank you. Thank you. We think your testimony might have been on item 36, League of Cities. Okay. So when we get to item 36, we will... Perfect. Any council member comments? Roll call. Oh, we, I'm sorry, we need a motion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Move to approve item 31. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call. <clears throat> Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. Our next item is item 34. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council Member Garcia? Yeah, I just wanted to see if we could get a, a short description of what this case was. Um. We'll turn to our city attorney. Mayor, members of the council, this was um, settlement of a claim of an incident involving a police employee and someone that they had a traffic um, encounter with. Um, the issues in the case were that the officer followed up with the individual, made contact with the individual who was a woman, and the woman then made allegations about the um, employee and felt that the, the, they had intimidated or felt threatened by the activity of the officer. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Any further comments or questions? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. The item passes 8 to 0. We next move to item 36, move. the National League of Cities dues. Move approval. We have a motion. We have a second from Councilwoman Stark. Uh, Leonard Clark has provided testimony that also includes this item in support of it. Any questions or comments? Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Passes seven to one. Uh, our next item is item number 37, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Move approval. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Clark, 
has pulled a card for testimony. Okay. Uh, for, for those who are watching online, Mr. Clark is in favor of this item. Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Passes seven to one. Item 38 is Maricopa Association of Government dues. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Passes 7-1. Uh, we next move to item number 43, which is a public hearing for the proposed 109th Avenue and Indian School Road annexation. We will open a public hearing. City Clerk, are there any members of the public wishing to address the council? No, Mayor. We will close the public hearing. Uh, we will not take any action on this item today. Uh, we next move to item 59, right, I, I, I think, uh, which is additional funding for medical occupational health staffing for the fire, fire department. Councilwoman Pastor. Yeah, I, I just want to congratulate the staff uh, for being proactive and uh, being the city really modeling our way uh, in Arizona of being proactive with our firefighters and cancer screenings and now starting to provide or gather the data that is needed uh, for as we move in the future and doing uh, preventative measures uh, in the future. So I really appreciate the work that's been done by staff and also by my colleagues. Thank you, Councilwoman. You have been working very hard on this. Would you be willing to make a motion for us? I move item 59. Yep. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes unanimously. Woohoo, Waring. <laughs> <laughs> We next move to item number five, which is a general planned amendment at the southwest corner of 19th Avenue and Alameda Road. Item 96 and 95 are uh, related. We will start with a staff report from our planning director. Do the hearings together. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Item 95 uh, is related to 96. It is a general plan amendment for the southwest corner of 19th Avenue and Alameda. Uh, this is a request to go from uh, industrial to residential 15 plus for a 20 acre site. Uh, here is the proposed uh, location outlined in yellow. The uh, Happy Valley Road is just uh, to the north off the screen and I-17 is just to the east uh, or the west by way of uh, reference for this um, aerial map. This is the general plan current designation. The proposed is multifamily residential 15 plus. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation. The related uh, case is rezoning from A1, Deer Valley Airport Overlay, which is what DVAO stands for, to R3A for that same 20-acre site. Staff does recommend approval per stipulations. It's uh, exact same site. This shows the surrounding zoning. What you have uh, planned residential that's under construction uh, to the east. To the north and, uh, and west, you have residential and directly north you have a hotel uh, in C2 as the surrounding zoning within this area. Here's a proposed uh, apartment project site plan, and these are the proposed elevations. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation and adoption of the related resolution for item 95 and the related ordinance for item 96. And with that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for our planning director? <laughs> We'll open the public hearing on both items 95 and 96. We will have separate votes, but we can take items, uh, we can take testimony on both 95 and 96. 
Uh, we have two cards on this item, Kevin Wisdom and Nick Wood, both are available to speak if necessary. Uh, where, let's. I'll pass now. Beautiful speech. <laughs> Great comments. And um, I assume Kevin also will pass. Two great, great examples of oratory. So we close the public hearing. Uh, we next uh, move to a motion on item 95. To approve the Planning Commission's recommendation and adopt the uh, related ordinance or second. resolution. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Novakowski? Yes. Castor? I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> Stark? Yes. Williams? Oh, Williams? Y yes. <laughs> Where? Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 0. Item 96, do we have a motion? Mayor, I would move. Um, Recommendation per the Planning Commission and adopt the related ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 0. We next move to item 95, which concerns the southeast corner of 11th Avenue and Maryland. I'm sorry, 90, 97, thank you. Uh, we'll begin with a staff report from our planning director. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Item 97 is a request from R110 to rezone to R16 for a 2.51 acre site for proposed single family residential development. Staff does recommend approval subject to stipulations. This uh, yellow area is the subject site and outlined. You see it's a, a long kind of narrow uh, parcel along Maryland Avenue. This shows the surrounding zoning, which is R16 to the north and to the east. To the west and south is R110 zoning. Uh, and there's other R16 uh, as well within the, the larger area. This is the applicant's proposed uh, site plan. And these are the proposed elevations for the single family uh, development. Staff does recommend uh, approval of this per the memo from the planning development director uh, dated today. That memo has uh, additional stipulations uh, that council district five has been uh, working on with the neighbors and the applicant to uh, address some of the issues that uh, the councilwoman heard as part of, of her outreach with the community. Uh, it does include uh, the stipulations to address all the things like sidewalks, the, the um, number three addresses, additional balconies where they can't overlook was something that was important to the community. Uh, there are other stipulations, uh, number 10, that addresses a maximum number of 15 lots. Uh, one of the other integrated stipulations uh, that the councilwoman's office really worked with the community on is uh, about height, and so a minimum of four one-story homes and a maximum of 11 two-story homes. Uh, and so within those 11 two-story homes, six of those ones uh, have to have a smaller portion, not to exceed 60% of the building footprint for that second story. So really making sure to push that height away from the, the property line as much as possible. And also uh, have the applicant uh, construct a seven foot high wall along the east, west, and south property lines. A, a variance would be necessary to do that, but again, providing some privacy for surrounding properties and then also uh, preserving mature vegetation within the area. And then lastly, uh, a stipulation that uh, development be conditioned on uh, pulling grading and drainage permits uh, and inventory and salvage uh, and landscape plan within 12 months of the approval of this zoning. Uh, this particular case uh, did have a tie vote at the Alhambra Village Planning Committee and also a, a tie vote at the Planning Commission. Uh, so it does come forward well, with a staff recommendation of approval per the memo uh, that came out today with those stipulations that I just outlined. And with that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the Planning Director? Uh, we will next open the public hearing 
we will hear uh, 15 minutes from each side, those who are marked in favor and those who are marked opposed. Uh, we traditionally begin with the applicant and either side can reserve some of their 15 minutes should they want to respond to people with a different perspective on this particular issue. Uh, so we will open the public hearing. Uh, the applicant, Nick Blue, or we have uh, Janet McGrath, and I will turn to the applicant about who will speak, speak first. Hello, Council, Madam Mayor. Appreciate your time, and thank you for reviewing this case. Um, this is a case we've worked closely with uh, Councilwoman Gardado to, oh, thank you. Uh, to attempt to reach a compromise with the neighbors so that it would be mutually acceptable. Uh, when we first brought up the project, the goal was to do 35 townhomes. We quickly found that that was not what the neighbors wanted, and we adjusted our plan down to 18 single family, then 16, then 15. And at every level, we have compromised with product type. We went from more modern, uh, which you may have seen in that last slide. Uh, that is actually not the product that we're putting out now. It's going to be more craftsman, a little more transitional, and we felt like in conjunction with working with the councilwoman's office and the neighbors, that that would be more in line with uh, what the neighborhood feels and, and going along with uh, the current design. Um, I recently attended a smart growth summit. Uh, the council, uh, I'm sorry, the Madam Mayor was kind enough to speak there. And I feel that our project is 100% in line with smart growth for what the city of Phoenix is going with with the general plan. Uh, we build Energy Star homes. We build sustainably. Our homes are, Nine, nearly 90% um, when, we, when we have to demo a home or take down a home, our homes are nearly 90% reused, repurposed, recycled, and that keeps it out of the landfill. Um, on top of that, we're a local business. My wife and I started this business. We are in Phoenix. Our daughter goes to school here in Phoenix, and we're committed to the community, to the neighborhood. And when I say that, we do that with not just the way we build, with quality, with Energy Star, with efficient uh, building practices, third-party audited quality. Uh, we also build front yard sitting areas, community areas for people to have a cup of coffee in the morning, a glass of wine in the evening, a spot where communities can gather, uh, which we feel is very important. We also follow it up with, we give away two bicycles at close to our buyers, uh, just to encourage them to ride their bikes and as much as we can to minimize the traffic that obviously is an issue. Uh, at the end of the day, we are one of the fastest growing cities in the country and these people need to live somewhere and we would love for them to live in the center of the core, to breathe vitality in their community and our homes which are designed uh, you know, exquisitely, I can say that because my wife is our designer, uh, they speak to what Phoenix is about and I would like to just ask for your support on this. Uh, we are committed to working with the neighbors. We already have, we've compromised at every level and we hope that you'll see that we're here to help improve this community. Thank you very much. Hello, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Virginia Senior. I'm representing Blue Sky Homes, the developer. And I'm going to take you through our uh, PowerPoint presentation. I think. Um, <clears throat> To begin, Maryland Homes, we are requesting to rezone from R110 to R16, and this will create a relatively minimal impact on the current density. We're going from uh, 11 possible homes as of right to um, to 15 homes, which is what we're proposing. We are going to show you that we are in conformance with the general plan that there is similar adjacent R16 zoning, <clears throat> including the Maryland Place project, which is just to the east of the property. It has the same exact size, lot, and number of units. We're creating single family detached homes that are for sale products so badly needed in Phoenix. As you heard from Nick Blue, the developer, he is a, a quality builder 
And he has the ability to follow through with this project financially upon rezoning, it, should we be approved. We have worked considerably with not only the neighbors, but also with Councilman, Councilwoman Delgado's office to uh, reach some consensus on several of the items. Several of those items uh, are made it into the stipulations that you saw added to this project. So the um, <coughs> site is shown here in red. <coughs> And the basis of our rezoning is conformance to the general plan. We have noted three core values. The first one is to connect people and places. Um, we're developing an underutilized lot. It's currently a, two single family homes on a very deep lot that is uh, right now used for boarding horses. The property is situated between two transit corridors, 19th Avenue and 7th Avenue. Our second core value is in building the sustainable desert. And again, as you heard from Nick Blue, we are committed to homes that are energy efficient, but not only that, that are brought into the core of Phoenix so that we are not adding to the length of uh, services for roads and utilities, et cetera. Um, our third core value is celebrating our diverse communities and neighborhoods. We're excited about this neighborhood because it's a well-loved neighborhood in the, um, the uh, northern part of Phoenix. And we feel that we are uh, building on that strength and integrating our project into that. I'd like to take a look at some of the surrounding characteristics. Again, the, the subject site is in the center in red. And as you will see going through here, the neighborhood is quite diverse. And there are a variety of zoning um, areas as well as building types. The first one you see there pointing to a um, trailer park is all of these homes are within a thousand feet of the subject site. Um, the next slide shows a relatively recent development, Canterbury uh, development where there are um, two streets of two-story homes. Very near this site is a City of Phoenix golf course. Across the street there are a number of single-family homes, some of them traditional, some of them contemporary in design. There's also a smattering of commercial office along uh, Maryland and um, commercial zoning. And our three properties, which are on the map shown in the orange area, uh, this particular parcel is R3 and uh, townhome style apartments. If we look at the site, what we see is our property, which is to the left, and the um, property to the right, which is known as Maryland Place. Maryland Place is 15 homes on a similar sized parcel. That has been in existence for, uh, I believe, more than uh, 15 years. Um, we're doing essentially the same uh, arrangement on our site. We have a center drive and 15 homes on either side. The existing parcel as you see there is a very long and narrow strip and um, underutilized at this time. Additional surrounding neighborhood areas. This is the property I spoke of to the east. This is the center drive aisle with properties on either side. This project has one story as well as two story homes within the complex. There's a sidewalk on one side and a curb and gutter on the other side. Here's an example of two story homes in that same complex and the, the drive in that complex. An example of an R3 property very close as I pointed out earlier. This is on 8th Street in Maryland. These are two story homes, contemporary in nature. Um, they also have a center drive, but um, quite 
shortened on the garage side. Our property has room in front of the garages for two cars to, to park for guests. The project direction uh, that we have taken on this is we began with multiple meetings with individuals in the neighborhood. We also met with um, the general neighborhood and we um, heard feedback from the general neighborhood and then we also spoke with several of the council members and most importantly with Betty Guardardo's office. We've modified the design multiple times with input from the neighbors. The original request um, has been changed and we have reduced the size of the lots to widen the private drive aisle. We have agreed, as you heard in the stipulations, to 11 two-story homes and four single-story homes. Uh, as of note, the current zoning, R110, does allow two-story homes in this, this zoning. We've accepted the city staff stipulations and the project meets city standards for parking currently as designed, but we have agreed to add parking spaces over and above what the city requires. What are the benefits to the neighborhood in rezoning this parcel to R16? It's going to remove a blighted parcel. It's going to bring new families, new energy, new spirit into the neighborhood, strengthening the people that care about this neighborhood. It stimulates the economy positively, and it brings a greater tax basis for benefit of fire, schools, police. We are presenting a fresh and innovative architectural design that highlights sustainability. We're increasing landscaping for greater walkability in the neighborhood, and we're increasing safety of the neighborhood with 15 uh, single-family homes. The site plan <coughs> um, begins with Maryland on your left, and we have, instead of taking the drive right down the center, we have moved that to the side and made a curved entry. This is for traffic calming. It also allows for increased landscape areas at the front. Okay, sure. Um, and uh, areas for um, landscaping as well. The original design was more contemporary in nature. This rendering shows the curved entry and the increased landscaping on Maryland. And we have now um, change to a revised character, more uh, traditional in nature, friendlier uh, entries, front doors, front stoops. There's a variety of zoning types, as you can see on this ma map, um, predominantly R16. R3 and a PAD, which is similar in density to R3. In summary, we request to rezone this property to R16. The property is in conformance with the general plan. City staff has recommended approval, and we have listened and modified the project in response to neighborhood concerns. The immediate neighborhood is a mix of zoning and architectural styles and densities, and the project sits, most importantly, in between two transit-oriented corridors. Blue Sky Homes is a contemporary company that <coughs> um, is building a, a quality project. At this time, we'd like to turn the mic over to some additional uh, speakers that would like to speak in favor. Wonderful. We have two minutes remaining. Would you like to have the final speakers now or after uh, the folks who are in opposition? Sometimes we find that useful as a way to hear if you have ability to address some of the concerns. So we have seven individuals who are interested in speaking on this item. All could use the, we could divide the 15 minutes equally or we can have spokesperson. It, there are several individuals who are interested in having Debbie Ramsey speak on, her, on their behalf, so we'll begin with Debbie. But it'll be one clock and there is a, a clock visible, we hope, showing the 15 minutes. So we'll begin with Debbie, unless Debbie tells us not. Yeah. 
Hello, and thank you for taking uh, the time to listen to us as citizens of the neighborhood. I just want to say a lot of the neighbors are not are at work and they couldn't be here, but we've sent letters, emails, we've expressed our sentiments to the city planning and as well to the planning commission. I've walked the neighborhood, 86 neighbors that I gave letters to, th uh, three of them were fine with rezoning, the rest of them, 83 of the neighbors were not. I believe that we have a majority of people that do not want the rezoning. Um, we're gonna have an increase in traffic, which we, we already have. The increase of homes means the population is going to be satur saturated on the, in the neighborhood. We're gonna have an increase in the population, uh, not the population, pollution, so the carbon monoxide is gonna get trapped in the area. Um, we're raising the heat index. We're not thinking of uh, the green spaces that we need with trees. I believe the R110 is enough to put 10 homes on the property with the proper landscaping, with proper parking as well for the guests of the residents. We're gonna have residents parking on the neighborhood streets and I just feel that that's a problem. And then I feel like we've gone through all the formalities of meeting after meeting while um, most of the, uh, the people here is forsaken their jobs and their families to be here to approve this R16, which I really believe that with the majority of the neighbors, that they don't want the rezoning. All they want is Nick Blue to build beautiful, uh, you know, 10 beautiful homes with lots of, with space enough for a family, because I don't think anyone would want their kids to play on the street. My brother-in-law, which is not here, he's a police officer for the city of Phoenix, and had to do du duty for um, the arrival of Michael Pence, was told by Blue that he received considerable interest from, um, uh, for the property from major national corporations with deep pockets and lots of lawyers. Therefore, he'll not compromise one iota. He wants the 15 homes built on the property. Uh, that's what he wanted. The 35 homes was never considered by the planning commission as well. I just wanted to note that. And that he, uh, these people with the deep pockets would definitely fill whatever they could for the city. If the city government's promise to the residents it, to see that it's reasonable development for the neighborhood will protect them from unwarranted violence done in the home environment, why does the city government even bother to do that if it will sweep aside the protections at the behest of any developer that asks for the rezoning of property. We have R16 that has acre, uh, you know, half acre homes on it, and I can just see those people building three and four homes on each property, and then it's just a continuation. We're continually putting more and more homes on a quarter of an acre a stretch uh, that there's no parking on the streets, and I just, it's too much, too much. And then the R3 for the, tra uh, the trailer park, what's gonna happen with that? The church is building 35 condominiums, what's gonna happen with that? I feel like there's just all these homes being pushed onto this one short stretch, which is gonna cause a lot of traffic problems. Does anyone else have comments? Sure. Yeah. Hi, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm just uh, a nothing nobody that lives in the neighborhood. And I tell you that it is very well packed in the morning. You have two or three blocks on Maryland every morning trying to get our cars backed up that far. And I don't know if you're aware that the church down from us, the, the, the Lutheran church, is now going to sell some of its property and build some more homes more dog droppings on the street that we've got to walk around. Enough is enough. Uh, I don't know what uh, we can do to stop it. I'm pretty sure that uh, whatever needed to be done has been done to build these homes. Um, I'm to understand they wanted to sell them for about 400,000, uh, <clears> and that would be 15 homes at six, six, 6 million. Why can't they build 10 homes at 600,000, still gonna make the same amount of money. If you change this zoning, you're gonna take a nice neighborhood and make it worse. Thank you. Uh, 
Good afternoon. I have papers to distribute to each of you. I have, I have all this information. I, I tried to get everything established a couple days ago. I had to get an interpreter. Uh, so I had finally got it available this morning. Uh, so time was a little short. So I had to write it down on paper by hand. And that's what I'm distributing to you all today. I live directly across the street of the two lots that they're discussing. I have to live with that, all of this construction. A lot of the people here don't understand the effects of the development that it'll have. I will live directly across the street from it. I'll see it every day. I'll have to deal with the parking directly. There's nothing wrong with the homes nearby, you know, with the area with the horses. There's no problems there. I think it's wonderful that it's there. And people of the area are very aware of the animals and the farms of the area. It's very beautiful. There are wonderful people that live there. And then people drive through and enjoy it. Why ruin that? Why ruin that beautiful area? I think we should just leave it be. We have a park down the road. There's a golf course that we could maybe have there. I think everybody is comfortable and, and it would be a very friendly environment. I feel as if the community is already oversaturated. There are people already in the houses there. I don't think that they are need to have the, uh, that much addition to the area. Especially since I've been discuss, discussing it with the people, I don't believe that they need that. No one wants that. You know, all they see is the sign that says blue sky, and they were confused, what was that about? So then they started discussing amongst themselves. It's, it's not something that anyone wanted. There's been no communi or not much communication, just as the other people before me have stated. And then they, they were talking about wine in the evening and things like that. That's not something we need. That's not something for our, com our community, and so I'm opposed to that. Thank you for your time. Hello, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for the time. My name is Fred Stevenson. I'm 71 years old and born and raised at 6321 North 11th Avenue, which was named Canterbury Lane until 2000. It was named Canterbury Lane by my grandpa and grandma, Fred and Elsie Canterbury, in 1944, when they acquired acreage and built their home at 6311 North Canterbury. My property at 6321 North 11th, or Canterbury, which was passed on to me by my mom and dad, who were married for 74 and a half years, borders Mr. Blue's property along the west property line. Growing up in our neighbor, in our home and neighborhood is a wonderful memory, with large yards for playing and family gatherings. Neighbors from 7th Avenue to 15th Avenue knew one another and the children gathered at each other's homes for various activities. Our closest and dearest neighbors on Maryland Avenue were the Andersons, now the Hypels, the Drapers, now the Scots, and the Ramses, all adjacent to our property. That was then and the same atmosphere continues today up and down this stretch of Maryland Avenue. <clears throat> Through time there have been rezoning designations granted to a few plots of land in the area from R110 to R16 and others. This has been gradual and now I feel we have arrived at a pivotal moment in this neighborhood's history. In our 75 years here, it has always been quiet with no instances of vandalism or violence and the enjoyment of spacious lot sizes throughout. Now I, as a property owner adjacent to this proposed project, Wonder if it is time to step back, take a moment to smell the roses, and listen to the flocks of birds in large shade trees. It is time to think about infill developments. Is it time to think about infill developments that are too dense? Would fewer homes on Mr. Blue's land matching the character of existing homes already there be more appropriate than his desire to build his proposed project? 
Is it okay to propose the thought of preserving neighborhood character over promoting inappropriate change? Could this beautiful island neighborhood be preserved and start a trend in that regard? This beautiful place was originally zoned R110, and I know that myself and many others would like to see that preserved. We are not against infills, but would like to see them not change long existing neighborhood character. Thank you. Thank the mayor and the council for listening to me as well. I'm Todd Sutherland on one of those cards there. I'm in the property just directly adjacent to the proposed development here. I'll try to be quick about this. Um, I'm concerned by the fact that you might overemphasize the terms blight and underutilization. These properties became underutilized and potentially blighted after they were overpaid for by the developer. I myself would have bought one of those properties and installed my own sister in it had it come up for market value. Both of those homes are solid, good bones homes. Each requires about eighteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to turn into a fine, fine historical home. Uh, as far as this this notion of compromise being an impetus in this whole conversation, this all started with the nonsensical notion of thirty-plus homes or thirty-plus dwellings on these two relatively small properties, although they appear large. That was unlikely to ever happen in the first place. So we start from this this fanciful notion that we're going to move down from this to here, you should move up from your place. Well, I see it going from two homes to 11 already being a burden on the property. But I understand zoning is zoning. The buyer should understand zoning is zoning as well. It's no one else's fault that they bought a property that they can't build what they want to build on. Uh, this has to stop somewhere. Using the properties to the east as an excuse for what they want to do on the existing property they're already taking destructive elements that already exist and using it as a justification for further destruction of an environment that we all love. We have homes there for that reason. We aren't there to see it overutilized. Uh, I think that covers my points. Thank you very much. Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Nilson. I live in the neighborhood for eight years. I have a family of four. I know all my street neighbors by name. Uh, I participated in three or five re-hearings and I only heard a strong opposition overall. I have heard no uh, compromise from the builder in, in mitigating this. Uh, we know that rezoning is a matter decided case by case, by case but the particularity of our uh, block is that we are a cushion block between a good historical zone, a good historical block and the high traffic 19th Avenue uh, block, not so good block. So if we allow all this rezoning be happening as the way, the, at the pace they are happening, we will just degrade the cushion block and we will have a yes or no uh, zoning overall in our neighborhood. And I will be very happy to leave the, the neighborhood. I, I already saw my, my property low down $50,000 in the last six months, uh, maybe not for this. So uh, what we, we suggest is the zoning to be kept because Nick can build his eight houses, not 15 or more, and he ha can have his good profit on this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Jim Ramsey. I live at 1039 West Maryland, which is the property immediately to the west of the proposed project. Uh, I moved there in 1948, some time ago. I just, I believe Mr. Blue stated he wants to improve the, uh, the neighborhood. I believe the neighborhood's wonderful, has been, still is. I think in this case, honestly, less is better. I think the properties are being overdeveloped. We're losing the fiber, the sense of community we've had for many, many, many years. And I just believe that uh, the property was bought as R110, and it should remain R110. I think we need to stop overdeveloping these areas in Phoenix. These properties will not exist for much longer. Continual, continual perspective development will take them all away. And I think we need, this is a character of this city it's been a character of this city for a long time. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have one minute left 
for the oppos uh, folks uh, who are opposed to the project, and I think two minutes left for the folks in favor of the project. Would you any, uh, are we comfortable moving forward? Would you like, anyone like to? All right. I get, I'm just going to talk about uh, the oversaturation of the neighborhood where the schools are, it's going to be difficult for the schools to handle more uh, children as well as the fire department that I spoke to on in Glendale. They told me that they're oversaturated with calls to begin with. So this is not only a problem for our neighborhood, but it's also going to be a problem for the city. Uh, there also was, it was told to me by a neighbor that in their small complex with 10 homes, that when they had an emergency, they could not get the fire department in there because of cars being parked on the street. So prevented the emergency vehicles to come in. They had to run to the person to you know, save the person from the emergency that they were called for. So we just go back to oversaturation. We just want the property be kept at R110. Uh, we're fine, we're compromising with 10 homes or 11 homes, and I feel that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are we comfortable closing the public hearing? Mr. Blue? No, we'd like to speak. Right, two minutes. Uh, and if you could state your name, that would. My name is Janet McGrath. I live at 6533 North 10th Avenue. I've lived there for over 20 some years. First off, I want to thank the mayor and the council people especially our councilwoman, Betty uh, Gordado, who has really helped us, um, her staff and her concerns that we, ha that we have, they listen to. The things that have been said earlier are the same things that I was going to say, most, most of which is that it, the compromise is 15 homes. It isn't compromise at 15. We are sacrificing tremendously um, our zoning to put in more zoning. What are we getting from it? We've gotten a few minor things, but we have not gotten everything we wanted. When we talked to Alhambra um, Village Committee, when we also talked to uh, the planning and zoning, when we had those meetings, they all said, blue has to go back to the community. Also, they said compromise. Here's the big problem. The big problem is we didn't have anything to compromise other than giving up our zoning. What do you do with that? So we did talk to our councilwoman, her staff. They helped us to, to weigh the pros and cons. And as we raised the pros and cons, um, we discussed some of those things. We sh uh, Blue, they showed us Blue's new development or his two-story building, or one story I can't remember now. We asked for a mirror in the development of the development next door because they keep touting the east side development. And the east side development is, is fine and we asked it to line up the same. They have five two story and the rest are one story, which fits more in line with the neighborhood and with what they keep saying, they're kind of modeling it after. Um, the other thing is that uh, they already said what they're going to build four one story, six one and a half, and five two story. Uh, we, were, we, we were told, or I shouldn't say we were told, he said that we asked him the question, if he couldn't develop this or rezone it, what would he do? He said he may have to sell the property. That's a little pill hard Thank to you. swallow. Thank you for your testimony. I, I would like, can I, may I make my closing statement, please? Uh, you've, if you could do one final sentence, please. Um, I w again want to, thank Betty Dogago and her and her staff for all that they've done, all of their concerns in caring. We could only compromise, no other choices, would have liked mirroring in our community. We are saying yes to the zoning, but only because, because. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. We will close the public hearing. We will turn to our District 5 Councilwoman. Well, first, first and foremost, I want to thank I want to thank my staff who worked diligently with the neighbors and re, in the rezoning request. We have attended, as everyone has said, multiple meetings. 
we have met um, with neighborhood leaders one-on-one. On, one on one. Um, we canvassed the neighborhoods and spoke to dozens of different homeowners. We sat down with the residents adjacent to this property. We attended, my staff attended the village planning committee and the planning commission meeting. We have helped provide answers and documents to multiple requests for information from interested neighbors. I believe that today we have reached the best possible outcome for this project, one in which neighbors were able to sit at the table in good faith. It is important to remember that without rezoning this property, Mr. Blue and his team would be allowed to build up to 11 units parcel. Neither neighbors or nor I would have the say in the height of units, the design of the homes, the amount of guest parking, the direction of the balconies, the walls that surround the project, the timeline of the project. It is because a developer is requesting a rezoning that we have a seat at the table to create a project that achieves the best possible outcome for the neighbors. Working with the neighbors, our team tell craft multiple stipulations that hold the developer to the highest standards. The stipulations that our office and leaders from the adjacent neighbors have hammered out include the multiple protections. The density of the project will be limited to only 15 units. Of those units, four of, of shall be one-story homes, and a maximum of six will be one-and-a-half-story homes. The developer will pursue a variance to build a seven-foot minimal wall around the project. The developer will minimize the removal of existing health vegetation and will follow the state's native plant laws for any trees of, of, that cannot be used. Trees planted along Maryland will be integrated with the character of the neighborhood. The project will provide a minimum of four visitor parking spots in addition to the parking provided in the individual driveways. The rezoning of the project is contingent on the project starting within the next 12 months. Unfortunately, we are unable to require a stipulation that restricts the use of short-term rentals, such as Airbnb. This is something that the neighbors and I believe it is incredibly important to protect the integrity of the neighborhood. So I would like to ask the developer to give his commitment on the record to today that he will protect, restrict the use of short-term rentals and the CCNRs signed with the incoming homeowners. Mr. Blue. Ours. Thank you. So with this commitment on the record and the multiple stipulations to protect the neighborhood, I am supported of this rezoning request. I would like to take a moment to thank a few of the neighbors in particular Dina Smith and her husband Scott welcomed us into their homes for multiple neighborhood meetings and provided a refreshingly honest perspective while we worked together to come to the best possible outcome. Linda Colino provided expert experience in the rezoning process and was an integral part in conveying the pros and the cons the neighborhood had in front of them. Janet McGrath and her husband Brian were steadfast in their desire to protect their neighborhood while appreciating the challenging decisions we had in this case. Michael and his fiance Kate were helpful from the very moment we met them at 19 North. They were the youngest neighbors involved in the, in the dialogues and their commitment to the future of their neighborhood was appreciated by everyone involved. Robert Schwartz and Roberta, Chuck and Cheryl and all the members of the Maryland Place Homeowners Association who represent the neighbors directly to the east of the project. They will most likely be the ones most impacted by this project, so their involvement in this process has been instrumental to us. Thank you to Larry, Tammy, Sheree, and Debbie Ramsey for participating in our conversations and all for your helpful input. Finally, I would like to thank all the neighbors and residents who have called or emailed our office, who have attended the meetings, who have spoken to our team, in the neighborhood or taking the time to come out today. Thanks to all the participating, we were all able to get the best possible outcome for this project. As a former organizer that has negotiated multiple contracts with big corporations for most of my career, I understand that, that when you take a seat at the table and bargain, you never win everything you want. 
but neighbors have pushed hard, my office has pushed hard, and I believe that the stipulations and commitments we have on this project address the concerns we have today. So I, I would like to make a motion to approve item 97 with all the 16 stipulations. Second. We have a motion and a second. Oh. Thank you, Councilwoman, for your hard work and your staff's hard work on this item. Any council member comments? Mayor, Mayor. council members? Adopt we we'll just need an adopt the related ordinance. Uh, it's per the memo of today's date and adopt the related ordinance. So a motion to approve per the memo from the planning and development director dated October 2nd, 2019 and adopt the related ordinance. Yes. Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski? Mayor, I got a comment. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Betty for her leadership. Um, it's hard when it comes to planning and zoning and when you have neighborhoods that are affected by new development. But when you try to sit people down together to figure out some common ground, I think you found the best common ground possible. Thank you, Betty, for um, your hard work, your staff's hard work. And um, I believe this is the best win-win for both sides. Um, congratulations. And I'll be supporting this. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Stark, did you have... Oh, you had a second for the motion. Wonderful. Councilwoman Pastor, do you have a comment? Yes, I do. Alan, um, could you please explain the 12 month? So, uh, Mayor and Councilwoman uh, Pastor, uh, in this case, uh, the stipulation requires that the applicant uh, pursue their, the development of the project and they must uh, pull a grading and drainage permit and a landscape inventory and salvage plan within 12 months of the council approval. So that's the, the first step in, in the development process uh, and that timeline ensures that uh, the, the current applicant is continuing to work in good faith to, to move the project forward as quickly as possible uh, and that's why there's the, the 12 months on that. Okay, so if they pull that within the 12 month and it becomes the 13th month or the 14th month and uh, decide to sell that property, what happens? So, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Pastor, the city can't legally control who owns property through a zoning right. process. So any property owner can sell whatever property they wish. Uh, you know, in that case, they could still sell the, the property. They would have to meet all the stipulations okay. that are in, in place to protect the community. So the, the building height step back provisions that were negotiated, the number of two story, all those things would have to be met regardless of who owns the property. And that's what I wanted to put on the record, that all those stipulations have to be met uh, within, uh, if it's sold, they have to meet the stipulations. The other question is, if they don't meet the stipulations, what's the next process? Uh, if they didn't meet the stipulations, they would have to come back in and request to modify the stipulation and seek more time. Uh, that would have to be done through a public hearing process. The, the village planning committee, the planning hearing officer, and ultimately be ratified by council if everyone agreed. If people don't, then it could get appealed to the planning commission and then appealed for a public hearing before the council. So it starts basically all over. Right, just focused on that okay. stipulation. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. Decisio? Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 to 0. Thank you. That uh, concludes the agendized portion of our meeting. We will uh, pause for a moment to give people a chance who, would, who are here for that agenda item to leave. We will next move to the public comment portion of our meeting. Uh, Mr. Leonard Clark, we will have you up first. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. And first of all, because I know, th being this is the fifth largest city in the United States of America, my name is Leonard Clark, born right down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital. I want to uh, wish uh, Bernie Sanders and his family well. Whether you're a Democrat or 
Republican. He is a hard campaigner, and we wish him well. We know he's going to be campaigning back on the road soon. So just want to get that out of the way. As you know, I'm asking the mayor and the vice mayor and whatever other members of you and the governor of Arizona who will be visiting with the vice president of the United States, Mr. Pence, who will be flying into Sky Harbor as announced by mainstream media at approximately 5 p.m. today, I want you to ask him uh, to, first of all, condemn for our favorite son, Senator John McCain, who was insulted by his boss, the president, uh, by saying that good soldiers don't get caught, something to that effect. I want you to ask Vice President Pence to personally express your request that we, the citizens of Phoenix, get an apology from the man who dodged the draft with bone spurs. Secondly, I want you to ask Vice President Pence if he still supports uh, this man in the presidency who advocated for the shooting of our undocumented brothers and sisters in the legs. Third, I want you to ask Vice President Pence, because we are the fifth largest city in the United States of America, and you will be visiting, and Doug Ducey, I know you're listening, and Senator Martha McSally. We as the fifth largest city that Vice President Pence will be flying into today, I wish that you ask him, does he support death threats by the President of the United States against whistleblowers who have gone by the law, who the Director of National Intelligence has vouched for? There are a lot of good people. You know. I'm on the left sometimes, and I view, and I know people, when they hear the word CIA, they think they're all evil, but I don't think that's the case. There are many patriots in the CIA who have given their lives and who fight right now for our country. So I ask that you please, you would say, well, Leonard, why are you bringing up national politics? This is a city. Well, we're the fifth largest city, and Vice President Pence is flying into Sky Harbor in less than an hour, or a little over an hour. Uh, now that the Secret Service has heard this, maybe he'll... Uh, have to be afraid of the people of Phoenix because we just want to ask questions and he'll fly into Tucson. But again, please ask him, do, and, and please express that, and please ask him, I ask you on behalf of myself and other citizens who feel the same way, tell him to please ask President Trump to come out and say he does not support making death threats against whistleblowers, does not support shooting undocumented immigrants in the legs. Enough is enough. We need to understand, and you know what, it's all about hate with this president, but I love my, my friends who follow Trump as well, because you know what? It is hate that gives men like Trump power. And in this, this nightmare is going to end soon, and I extend a handout to all of those who support Trump, but the people at the very top who know that he's selling out our country, uh, colluding with Vladimir Putin, no. You need to understand you're violating everything this republic stands for, and Kosoji, I, I wish to express condolences to the family of Mr. Kosoji, a journalist murdered. The president expressed today almost that the, the journalists of this country are the enemy of the people. No, the fourth estate are Thank one of our greatest testimony. attributes. Thank you so much. Elizabeth Venable followed by Brandon Hornick. Okay, so thank you for clarifying your position on what you do when you seize the possessions of homeless people. Because of this clarification, people now have the right to watch each other's things and not have them thrown away. Before, police slash park staff slash sanitation would seize property and not let friends watch it. However, your policy is not in compliance with the Ninth Circuit ruling in Levon v. City of Los Angeles, according to my ruling. This is primarily because they are not being allowed to leave their things when they need to go to the restroom or go to food or anything like that, which is another part of the ruling. Um, also, you're entering into their possessions into evidence as opposed to simply storing them. And that's a disincentive for many people to go and reclaim their possessions. Um, let me get just a second. This phone is annoying. Okay, you need to store them appropriately where people can access them for 90 days. This is not supposed to be stored by the police and they are supposed to be able to visit their possessions. It specifically says they have to be able to visit their possessions. Okay, uh, these items do not become your property, the property of the city, simply because people have committed misdemeanor crimes of nuisance or obstructing a thoroughfare. Also, people are allowed under the ruling to step away from their, oh, I got that part. You seem perturbed that I send in the same petition. You say that your lawyers have resolved it. I don't particularly think that you have. I think you have guaranteed the rights of people to watch their friends' things, and that is it. 
It also will be seen if these officers are educated to follow the policy in all cases. It is not difficult to find people who have suffered under these policies. With regards to answers, since you are now offering them, is Phoenix Cares a diversion program you use when you remove campers? I am not sure. Do they arrest you if you don't go with Phoenix Cares? Is this a formal arrangement? If so, is it in statute that is a diversion program? How long must people then stay with Phoenix Cares to not be arrested? And what exactly are they being offered? Is it consistent? Is it appropriate shelter? Are there work requirements? Do you have to be screened for mental health? What it, what is being offered, is it consistent, and is it in compliance with the ruling? Those are my questions, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brandon will be followed by Joanne Scott Woods. Hello, my name is Brandon Hornick, and I'm a 20-year-old college student. I'm here to talk about social justice. In our nation, we know the principle that our law teaches us different things. Our law teaches us that murder is wrong and rape is wrong, and those are good things, but sometimes our law is wrong and it teaches us very horrendous things. In the 1800s, the law taught us that black people were used as property and you were allowed to have them as property, and that was insanely wrong and disgusting. But even though our law taught us that and we abolished slavery, we rolled into segregation, which is another principle of that some people are less than was taught to us, and our nation lived that way. And unfortunately, in 1973, our law has taught us that if you have a problem, you are allowed to kill it through Roe v. Wade. Not only if that problem is just a tiny problem, if that problem is your own child, you are legally allowed to kill it. And our law has taught us this. The rates of divorce, suicide, dropout rates, murder rates have increased tremendously since 1973 because our law has taught us one principle. If you have a problem, you are legally allowed to kill it. The Bible in Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that is what he will reap. In New Orleans, in the 1990s, they were the murder capital. They had 13 abortion clinics. They were sowing the most murder inside of the womb, and they were reaping the most murder in the streets. But as of today, New Orleans' murder rate has dropped increasingly, and it continues to drop because they only have one abortion clinic. Who has the most murders in the streets right now? And it's Chicago and they have 13 abortion clinics. What you sow, you shall reap. If you sow bloodshed in the womb, you will definitely reap it in the streets. And the last thing I wanna to say today is in Psalms, the Lord says, wickedness prowls around when vileness is exalted upon the sons of men. While we continue to exalt the vileness and wickedness of abortion, crime will continue to circulate our cities. It will continue to increase in our cities. The Lord uses the prophet Ezekiel to say, if you do not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. What we sow in the womb, we will reap in the streets. And I'll call you guys to repent of sowing and allowing the continuation of murder to happen in the wombs. And it will continue to reap it in the streets if we do not stop and repent of this murder. God bless you guys. Joanne will be followed by Kim Baker. Hey, my name is Joanne Scott Woods. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. When community members begin envisioning what it would be like to live in a city free of prejudice, that is when racial healing begins. Would you all as city leaders be willing to make a collective long-term commitment to embrace a new narrative, that of a belief in racial equity? In August 2017 at the U.S. Mayor's Conference, at which the president and CEO of the Kellogg Foundation spoke, they committed to goals similarly supported by the foundation, that of assuring the safety and security of communities to exist, and that of creating equitable communities to eventually revitalize our nation. National Day of Racial Healing was established by more than 550 US leaders who wanted to set a day aside to take action together to honor our humanity, acknowledge racial divisions, and engage all groups in efforts to increase understanding of one another. One way our city could recognize the Day of National Racial Healing is through a proclamation text that has been used since 2017 by government officials. In addition, beginning on the National Day of Racial Healing, the first Tuesday immediately following 
Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, we as a city can offer a specific opportunity for participating in racial healing by hosting a series of 11 discussions open to the public. Participants, including those from our police department, attending these community visioning sessions would be answering the question, how would Phoenix look and feel without racism? Results would be shared along with the themes that emerged and what we need to end racism in our city. Through this citizen petition, Kim Baker and I are asking you to commit to both so our children can thrive. The text for the mayoral proclamation is attached and the link to the model for community visioning sessions is available from the 2019 Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Annual Report. Thank you. I have copies for each and one for the city manager and the city clerk. Kim will be followed by Denise. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity. Um, I am in support of this petition. Um, I have uh, relocated back into the city of Phoenix. Um, once serving with the Community Partnership of Phoenix, I um, got to experience some great opportunities of, uh, from the grassroots end developing partnerships and seeing a, a community transformed. Uh, I don't have time to tell this particular story, but I support this petition and I've prayed over the uh, position in which I've been asked to serve in. And I, I'm at peace in serving in this. I, I would ask uh, mayor and council that that you all approve or uh, declare uh, for, for next year a National Day of Racial Healing, we are going to transform lives of young people that are coming forward by an act from today. Our children, and I, I speak collectively, have the greatest opportunities now to transform not just Arizona, but the world. But it starts here. And so as Joanne and I have mauled over this and, and decided on today being the day that we would come and speak to you all and present the petition, uh, Mayor, we would ask that, that you would declare a National Day of Racial Healing. It's not taboo. The word is not. And the endeavor is not taboo. We put people on the moon. We built some of the biggest uh, high-rise buildings in the world. When we put our minds to doing something, we are unstoppable as a, as a human race. And I'm not afraid to challenge racial healing. Matter of fact, I've grabbed a bull by the horns and I'm ready to run with this endeavor. We will. What we're here today to ask you all is to sign it because we're already moving forward. We had our first phone conversation the other day with uh, people in Michigan and things of that nature. So we're declaring from our end, we ask that you all accept it. We're not asking for any money because the money's going to come but it's gonna be beneficial for this city and our state. Thank you. Denise will be followed by John Forsyth. Hello again, Mayor, um, I'm here again with another concern. Uh, homeless life matters. That's what I'm heading for. Uh, for our homeless downtown Phoenix, uh, Cass. I'm sorry. Um, 
But I'm, my concern is um, we are having to be removed from, like there's no trespassing signs on certain places, but there are also no trespassing signs on trees, on dirt. So, um, and then they're cutting down the trees. You can't have a tent. You know, you, you, I believe that you have to have a search warrant to enter someone's uh, uh, tent to, to search it or whatever, because that's their home. Um, again, there's no, no place for, this is no longer uh, just homeless. This is homeless, this is a crisis, because people are dying in the heat, which is gonna get cooler, but then they're gonna be cold. So where do they go from here? Where, where, where will we go from this point? And um, they, the, the no trespassing signs is my concern. We need a designated place for the homeless people. And I'm, I'm sure that there is a place because I've seen empty parking lots, empty buildings, they're tearing down buildings, they're, they're not building up buildings and they're just tearing them down. And I know that there's somewhere, some place that can be designated so that the area can stay stay clean, the streets can stay clean, they put the restrooms there. I'm sure that there is a place because I've seen them for myself and they're owned by the city. So I'm asking to, that we could uh, consider mere having a designated place for uh, the homeless people to go because, I mean, I'm sure it's, it's really not clean. They, some people think that it's not clean and it's not because Trash is everywhere, stuff's everywhere, crap's everywhere, urine's everywhere, and it's just everywhere down at, by the, the location. So I'm again asking for a designated place for them, for, for us to house these people or tents so they can have tents, dogs have dog houses, and they, we, we have to bring our dogs in when it's hot, our animals, our pets, so what about humans? These, we're, we're speaking about lives, so homeless life matters to me. Thank you. John will be followed by Joshua Haskins. Uh, Joshua Haskins. All right, my name is Joshua Haskins. I'm here again to try to reason with grown adults and convey that it is wrong to murder innocent babies. Um, so first off, I wanna address something that keeps being brought up when we come here. We come here month after month to declare the same thing. We stand on the foundation of the gospel and we proclaim truth, God's word is true. And what we keep facing is people, I hope DeCicio is still on the phone because he keeps telling us, he's saying, well, you know, I don't know why you guys come I don't know why you're here on this local level when it's a federal issue. And I'm gonna blow a hole through what he's saying. I'm gonna tear down this straw man argument so that the truth is revealed here today. Because we come with, with medical evidence, we come showing that from the point of conception, it's a human being and that human being is alive. Okay, that human being is afforded all the same rights you and I are. You were once an embryo. You were once in your mother's womb and you're here today because someone didn't kill you. Okay, so first off, we're gonna address this from the top. The Supreme Court does not make law, and everyone here should know that. They made a court opinion, okay? They don't make law, that's left to the legislature. And so, we're gonna address this today. See, as Arizona, we already have a law. That's Arizona Statute 13-3603, which criminalizes procuring an abortion. So we already have the law, and I'm just asking for you guys to do what's right in the eyes of God and support the life of these babies and actually enforce the law. The city attorney is right here. It takes you guys telling him to enforce it. He tells the chief of police and you guys actually carry out the law that we have on the books. And if you wanna say that we can't do this on the local level, on the state level, I'm gonna show you right here. So 11 states right now have approved recreational marijuana, 33 states for medicinal. We're one of those states, okay? So we've defied the federal government, okay? Nine cities right now have declared themselves sanctuary cities for the unborn. That's uh, Wascom, Texas. We have Joaquim, Omaha, Naples, Roswell, New Mexico, Gilmer, Texas, uh, Tenaha, Texas, Riverton, and then Yadkin County. So we have it on the county level, we have it on the city level, and we have Alabama's estate. A Alabama passed the Human Life Protection Act, which is Bill uh, 314, HB 314, um, which 
it bans abortion. And so we see it on the state level, we see it on the county level, we see it on the city level. So don't you dare tell me, DeCicio, I hope you're listening, don't tell me there's nothing you can do. There is something you can do. But you're evidencing right now, your hearts, that you won't do anything. These babies are dying. 35 to 40 babies died today in Arizona alone. Okay, 70 million babies are dead in the United States. We've killed our own citizens, our own flesh and blood, our babies, and you guys sit there and do nothing. Make Phoenix a sanctuary city for the unborn. Do your duty as elected officials. Your main duty is to protect the citizens below you. Protect them. Do something before another 35, 40 babies die tomorrow. Do something before more blood guilt is heaped on you. The time is coming. You, we're all going to die one day, and we're going to stand before God in judgment. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to be found guilty. I want you to be washed clean by the blood of Jesus. But you have to turn from your sin. Christ says he's going to say one, Thomas one will or be two our things final to you. He's either going to say, welcome, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Josiah Thomas. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us. Um, um, I'm 21 years old, and I'm here to discuss social justice as well. Uh, as my friend stated, the law teaches, and there's a group among us, the preborn, that have had their rights removed completely, and they have no voice. Therefore, we have lost quorum. The meeting is adjourned. We are here to speak for them. <laughs>